Uh, Stana recently finished her three season arc as a star and executive producer of Amazon's TV series, Absentia. Her feature film work includes CVGV about the punk rock club in NYC, Big Sur based on the Jack Kerouac novel, Frank Miller's film, The Spirit, Rob Benton's Feast of Love, The Double with Richard Gere, and the Bond installment, Quantum of Solace with Daniel Craig. For eight, se se sorry, for eight seasons, Caddick starred as Kate Beckett on Castle. The ABC hit series brought in more than 10 million viewers weekly and is among the top five syndicated series in Spain, France, the UK, Italy, and Germany. Stana is dedicated to philanthropic projects with a focus on the environment and children's education, as well as health care. She resides in Los Angeles, speaks five languages, and holds dual citizenship of the United States and Canada. We are so honored that she's taking some time out of her very busy schedule to be here with us today. She's shared so much about how much she likes the work that we're doing and how uh, her passion aligns with what we do, so we can't wait to hear more from her. So without any further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Stana and Sydney for a little conversation. Hi, Stana and Sydney. I'm going to let you all take it away and I'm going to take a back seat here. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Sydney. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have some people from Australia watching right now and they're getting a kick out of your name. <laughs> oh my God. It's, it's how I like um teach people how to spell my name if they don't know how to i'm like it's sydney like as in sydney australia so yeah yeah smart, cool. smart. <laughs> <laughs> um so i watched i watched all of the films in advance um and was so impressed with the work that all of you girls did and i'm really excited that you're offering to ask me these questions and to sort of platform the conversation because I know that you're really keen on getting to know the industry, filmmaking, and so on. And we talked a little bit beforehand, and you said that you're 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 looking forward to hopefully getting into documentary filmmaking and maybe yes. even some animation and, and writing. And um, and so this is perfect. Now now we can we can start to get to know each other. And um, and if something I say doesn't make sense or whatever, please feel free to be like, Yo, wait, what did you say just now? You know? <laughs> And, okay, um, and I'll try to be concise because I can blabbity blab a lot. <laughs> oh, we'd love to hear it. Oh, my God. I want to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much for coming, by the way, and, like, talking to us. I wanted to say that, like, on behalf of everyone involved in the program, like, a very, very big thank you for being our keynote speaker and yeah. leading us into this exciting event. <laughs> Roar. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Okay. So I'm going to just hop straight into it. Um, My first question is, like, what was the path that led you to becoming a storyteller? How did you get into it? Yeah. Um, I think this one's, this is a really nice sort of starting point because um, sometimes people think that, oh, this is an industry that's not really accessible to me for one reason or another. Maybe it's too far away or maybe just it doesn't make sense in the scheme of the upbringing that they've had. So I'm... I'm I usually don't share this this story too much, but I think it's important right now because I want to say it, it wasn't an industry that was supposed to be on paper accessible to me either. I'm I'm an immigrant child. Uh, my parents are from Southern Europe. My first language is not English. Um, they migrated to Canada. They had me. They eventually moved to the States. So, you know, before I even knew what aliens were, apparently I was one. Um, and, and my people, they weren't fancy people. They were shepherds and subsistence farmers. And um, even though there weren't any palaces in our past, I was surrounded by loads of creative and very, very intelligent people in that company. But like for most immigrant families, the idea of becoming a storyteller, a filmmaker, an actor for a living, that's just not a reality, right? It didn't seem like a grounded or, or possible future for us. We didn't have connections in that world and that wasn't necessarily accessible. And I think that for a lot of immigrant families, we seem to focus more on practical, you know, traditional, reliable futures. So math, sciences, jobs in those fields are more promoted and those kinds of jobs are more honored. Anyway, 
<laughs> I followed I followed that influence for a while. I studied international relations and pre-law with a focus on international economics. Um, and then somewhere along the way, I course corrected and I got into a drama academy because I really wanted to study the craft of acting. And I felt it was important if I was going to, you know, seek out a future in this in this world. And then somewhere along the way, I decided to come to L.A., which like was totally bananas for most of my family and friends and i think that in some ways they're probably right right it wasn't it was like really tough beginning it was extremely overwhelming and there were times where this idea of entering into this field just seemed like such a huge mountain to climb and and an impossible thing to um to actually accomplish I mean, at first, I didn't even have a place to call home when I came to L.A. I spent the first few months in L.A. hopping around on colleagues' couches or sleeping on floors or in hostels. And I'll tell you what, some of those hostel experiences, they're more like scenes from like a girl interrupted than anything, <laughs> you know, safe and cozy and, 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 and sweet. Um, and then sometimes I even had to sleep in my car. I would park uh, and find a place usually in Burbank, because to me, I was like, huh, Burbank feels like really, you know, safe and, and suburban. <laughs> and I like put the blankets up on the windows and, and, um, and make a bed out of the out of the seats and, um, and pass out. And I, I even remember, like, as I was driving around this huge city, because Los Angeles is like this ginormous sprawl of a city. I'd be going around like on Mulholland Drive, and I'd see these huge houses. And I think, oh, man, just one, one room, just one room, please, you know, in my brain, I'd be like, even a bathroom, a bathroom would be ideal, I can make a bed out of the tub, I have everything I need, I can just like lock the door, I won't take up too much space, you know. Anyway, um, eventually, I, I did get a small apartment. And I remember walking into that place and getting down on my knees and kissing the floor because I finally had a safe place to sleep. I didn't have any furniture, right? I had blankets and pillows from my car that I kind of mm -hmm. laid out. Um, but this was a place where I could be safe and I could slowly start to build a future for myself. And I did. Bit by bit, got a few jobs. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> of course. To support myself, right? That's the beginning. You're just getting all these survival jobs, right? So you can pay for food and rent and la la la. And then eventually, um, I started setting up the building blocks of my career. Eventually, you know, student films and black box theater turned into paid gigs where, um, where my passion for storytelling became the source through which I put food on the table and, and a roof over my head. So that was kind of like, that was my like weird swiggly start. No, oh my god. I'm I'm also the child of immigrants. So I think it really your story really resonated with me because like my family is very supportive of my like storytelling endeavors, but I think like my own brain kind of gets in that way too of where I'm like, well maybe I should take a more like practical, traditional job because um it is more guaranteed. But um yeah, I think it's so important that we have people like you that show us we can definitely make it. So thank you so much. Oh, man, um, that's cool. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, of course. Okay, my next question is a bit more of a philosophical one. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, what value do you think storytelling has in the world? So, yeah, um, I think storytelling can be super powerful. Uh, but I think that there's two sides to that coin. Um, Storytelling has always been like a privileged position in, in a tribe. It's the avenue through which the tribe teaches wisdom. Um, and it's an avenue through which a tribe entertains its community and, and brings its community uh, together. And I think in a lot of ways, we're still, we're still those same people, right? We're still gathering around this proverbial fireplace, whether it's a TV or, you know, a movie screen or, or a video game. And, and we're educating or we're entertaining through stories. So for me, uh, storytelling is a critical element to the fabric of what it means to be human. And, uh, and nowadays, I think storytelling has this really incredible power to 
humanize and to help people relate to one another. And, and all of that's done through the hero's journey, through our main character's journey, you know, as an audience, we're asked to relate to, to follow, to root for our main characters, our heroes. And that gives us insight and connection to like, for example, a, a little boy from Afghanistan, like it did in the movie Kite Runner, or to a really spirited young girl from Japan, like it does in the movie Spirited Away, right? I love that movie. <laughs> I, lo I love that movie. <laughs> so this is why we, we need to make sure, we want to make sure that our stories actually reflect the tribe, the community. And that means that our heroes, our main characters, I'm not talking about the love interests. I'm not talking about the best friend. I'm talking about the main characters. They need to be from and reflective of the many ages and shades of skin, religion, sexualities, genders, everything that actually make up the tribe. Now, there's another side to that storytelling coin. There's another side to the power that that, that storytelling has. And um, that is that stories can also dehumanize. And we got to be careful about that. Um, we have to pay attention to who our culture's stories are regularly painting in a negative light. And we have to ask ourselves when we see that, you know, is this true? Is this serving the greater good? Or is this serving to oppress a group? And here's some of the few like red flags that show that a, a group is being dehumanized. Um, men are, are often painted as violent, untrustworthy, dangerous, immoral, sexually aggressive. And uh, women are framed as promiscuous sexually manipulative, violent, and immoral, right? And so if we become like inundated with the images of, of a group or a type of person that's shown consistently in that light, then those stories have the power to affect our perception of that group or that type of person. And so in those cases, I would encourage us, all of us, to be wary, aware of those influences and story stereotypes. I agree so much. And I think something that I actually talked about in the program was this concept of like media literacy. Yeah, and yeah. I think it's so important because when we do find those stories that are dehumanizing, it's really important to be able to kind of pick up the hints that the authors like unintentionally leave essentially of the story being dehumanizing so that we can consume it without like adopting those beliefs ourselves. So that also really, really resonated with me. Thank you for that answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting to hear the word, though. I didn't know that there was a term for it that, you know, that aims in that direction saying, like, look, you got to be media literate, right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, oh, of course. I love the term. I use it so often. <laughs> okay. Um, we are kind of running out of time, but I had just so much to say. <laughs> we got yeah. it. We got Tell it. Me. Okay. Um, I have two questions, so maybe if we could like speed-ish round them. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do okay, that. Cool. Go. Okay, um, what is your proudest storytelling accomplishment so far? Uh, yeah, my, my proudest storytelling accomplishment, I think, is like kind of like a big random like sprinkle of stuff. I really love it when I'm contributing to a story, a collaborative experience, and I'm able to elevate the story, deepen the characters through notes, through shots, you know, through through camera um, uh, angles and, and, and photography. And... Um, and then also through character adjustments. I really love it when, when we don't find, when we find ways of, of taking a character that might be a stereotype and, and deepening that character and giving it three dimensions, right? Any character, because the, there's the potential for the entire cast to really enjoy something meaty and juicy. Um, and then the second part of that is that I really enjoy when my cast and my crew and I say mine, not because they're mine, but because, you know, that, that's, I, I take possession of it. I feel like we're a family when we're creating something together. And when I feel that same sense of, of family and investment in the creative project, and I feel that sense of satisfaction that they're 
voice in some ways being heard on the project as well that gives me like a real boost of energy yeah it's just really like the importance of collaboration okay my last question is a very fun one <laughs> okay um, if you had all of the resources in the world and this includes time what kind of film would you make and you can also answer like what's your dream project <laughs> okay um so so there's kind of like there's two right um i think the first one would be sort of like my schindler's list not schindler's list in specific but my schindler's list i'm, I'm really curious about the sets of decisions that lead a group to decide that these large swaths of humanity hold no value and can and should be, you know, eliminated or annihilated. And I'm curious about that mindset, about how human beings get there, because I suspect that the path is, is not so clear cut. I don't think that it's, you know, really black and white. And once it takes hold, it just causes so much devastation. And I'm very curious about the journey to getting there. Um, and I'd like to explore that, I think, that tendency in our species to dehumanize, to annihilate. Um, and then in that same film, I think because I'm, I'm an optimist, I like looking at those beacons of light, those humans who, in the face of, of the worst of humanity, um, they're capable and they were capable of keeping their sanity and keeping respect for life, right? Um, so that's one project. I think that, you know, honestly, I feel like if I finish these two projects, I'm kind of like done. I'm like, whatever, man. I'm <laughs> finished. I'm good. I'm happy. I'm satisfied. Right. Um, and then the second project that I would love so deeply to do, um, is that I would just love to tell something super silly and super fun. You know, I want to laugh on set every day and enjoy it. And I want to bring that joy to the audience, you know, that sort of like classic, sweet film that people go to, I don't know, you know, at Christmas time or whenever, right? And for me, that was Princess Bride growing up, you know, I loved it. Um, and I still do. And it's just like a piece of comfort food. Um, and I'd love to bring that sort of a, a, a film to somebody as well. I love that. I'm always looking for like, cheesy, just like pure happiness films. Right? Like, yes, yes. I miss them so much. Um, I think they're like so important to have too for just when you want to like watch something and have fun. <laughs> it's important. It's important. It is. Yes. It's a nice balance. It's a nice yes. balance. Yeah. Definitely. Especially when we're, we're in the midst of this kind of a thing. Right. And you're kind of like, yes, yeah. a little, a little mood booster maybe. <laughs> yeah. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us and for offering your wisdom. I'm really happy that you could join our community and our space today um and it's such an honor thank you thank you oh, of course of course okay now i have the absolute pleasure of introducing fellow participant in the 2021 girls voices now pro 